Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and thanks for joining us. Just before we kick off, a quick check. Want to make sure that you can hear us. If you can raise your hand in the GoToWebinar panel. Excellent. I see a couple of hands raised. Thank you very much. And I want to make sure also that you can see a PowerPoint up that says technical update tips and best practices. Just a quick show of hands would be great. Looks like there's some hands going up again. Excellent. Well, welcome. Today's session is all about a technical update. We've got tips, best practices and considerations. I'm very pleased to join with me today, Paul Cole. Paul Cole is the technical liaison manager here with Nexus Solutions and I'm Darshni Shah, the product manager also here with Nexus Solutions. Great to have you join us today. Today's session is going to be led predominantly by Paul. And what we're going to cover in today's session, we're going to kick off first with a little bit of an introduction around upgrades, ports, hotfixes, versions of CISPRO, all of that. We're going to move on from there from a technical consideration into end of life. Now, nothing deep. Don't worry about it. We're going to focus on the technical element of it. We're talking about technical end of life. And then we're going to talk about best practices as well as some tools and utilities that we have available. Now that you know what we look like, we're going to switch off webcams just to give you a little bit more bandwidth and make sure you're focusing just on what we're talking about. I want to start off a little bit with terminology. There's a lot of things we're going to cover today. I'm going to start with the idea of ports. Now with CISPRO 7, especially if you've been in the CISPRO ecosystem for a while, you'll know that we've had the idea of ports with us for a long time, where if you've got a correction that you need, they would all get rolled up in a port that would be introduced either weekly, monthly, or every two months, depending on what phase of that particular release that it was on. As you move forward and we had new versions of CISPRO released, we would then be looking forward to moving on into upgrades. So if you're on CISPRO 6, you want to upgrade to the latest version of CISPRO, which is CISPRO 8. So we've introduced two concepts there. We've introduced ports, which are now legacy, and the idea of upgrades which exist between versions of CISPRO. The next thing I want to talk about is, of course, with the introduction of CISPRO 8, fixes are now coming out rather than in ports, you've got the idea of hot fixes. We change not just the terminology, but the technology in which that was deployed. And Paul will go into that in quite a bit more detail because this is really important. This is the way that we're now introducing either changes in the program from an error correction perspective or even introduction of some new smaller features in between. When I talk about in between what I mean, within CISPRO 8, we've got the concept of releases and updates. CISPRO 8, the last release that we've had until this week has been CISPRO 8 2021 R2. As of this week, we're really happy and excited to announce the fact that we've got a new release of CISPRO 8 2022. They each have different names and the way that you would migrate from one to the other, you would actually update to a release. And there's some different nuances and considerations that are incorporated across all of them. That's our baseline terminology. Now that I've done the easy part, I'm going to hand over and get Paul to do a slightly deeper dive into upgrades, ports, hotfixes, and releases, and what that means for you. Over to you, Paul. Thanks. Thank you, Dustin. Um, as um, some of our attendees uh, are not on CISPRO 8, uh, we wanted to give you uh, some information and considerations for when you do undertake an upgrade to the latest CISPRO 8. So the first um, item here is uh, the infrastructure. Um, first of all, CISPRO 8 can coexist on an existing CISPRO application server. Um, CISPRO 8 installs its services with a CISPRO 8 uh, prefix. However, having said that, um, you need to consider uh, where the SQL databases are going to be stored, i.e. what instance, and what about other Nexus products such as Translution, MOM, which are not as easy to coexist on an existing um, platform. Therefore, existing or new infrastructure on supported operating systems and SQL Server versions can be used, and ideally on the latest uh, supported Microsoft um, platforms. To be honest, the norm is to provide new infrastructure, new server. Nexus um, would want to approve the intended infrastructure, 
Um, plus, we would recommend a technical scoping exercise is performed on your current setup, only because we've probably not visited your server setup for a number of years. And finally, on this inf infrastructure subject, um, Nexus can provide a minimum specification based upon upon um, our products installed on your current setup uh, and your user accounts. Um, and some of this information, of course, will be deemed from the technical scoping exercise. Moving on to uh, the CISPRO 8 client. The CISPRO 8 client, like the server components, uh, can coexist uh, with older versions on CISPRO on your machines. A batch file will be provided to aid with the rollout of the CISPR8 client software and that batch file can be adapted to include any other software that needs to be rolled out to the client such as the automail printer. Crystal reports SRS, um, CISPR8 is backward compliant with older versions of Crystal reports. Uh, what I'm basically saying here is that if you've got a CISPRO 7 environment and you are running something like Crystal 2013 or 2016 on the client, if you put the CISPRO 8 down, it does work with it. However, we have had users experiencing issues with CISPRO 8 running with the older versions of the Crystal. So our recommendation going forward here is to uh, install server-side reporting. Um, certainly, in do this at the start of the CISPR8 project, and it's for these reasons. One, this will avoid any user bad experiences with CISPR8 running with old Crystal versions. Two, no newer Crystal runtime needs to be installed at this early stage of the project. Three, if you are planning to uh, utilize the CISPR web UI with CISPR8 and or the CISPR Expresso uh, product, then server-side reporting is a mandatory requirement. What I'm saying though is if you want to print from Avantit or print from Express, or uh, it is a mandatory requirement that you have server-side switched on anyway. Further down the line, uh, if you decide nearer to the go live uh, that you want to go back to client side, the option is there. What it does mean is that the Crystal software will have to be installed on, on the client at go live. And again, a batch file can be provided um, to aid with that rollout of the Crystal runtime. And the final area, which is <clears throat> one of my um, ball of contentions, is change control. Um, very important that any changes which you want to keep within your CISPRO 8 environment is documented. It can be at high level or it can be more detailed. Um, this information ideally needs to come back to us through the project manager, and that will aid us to decide how we recover these changes back into your CISPR8 system at go live. Depending on what version you're moving or upgrading from, um, we have experienced that people are changing things like um, access to new programs, SRS changes, role changes, or their actual introduction of roles within your uh, CISPR8 setup. Next, we're going to talk about um, CISPR8. Um, so this section is focusing on existing CISPR8 customers, albeit not on the latest release, only because it's only just come out on Monday. CISPR8 has been out since 2018, and initially there were two releases a year until last year. So, Sandbox, um, it's becoming more and more a requirement um, to have a Sandbox. Um, it's very handy to enable the testing of the new releases, such as the 2022 release, uh, to test hot fixes, which we're gonna go into detail shortly, and also if you want to test and look at some of the new modules or new features um, within uh, the latest release without impacting your production system. It does not need to be uh, an all singing and dancing server specification, unless of course you are actually doing some form of performance testing 
and therefore you probably have the same sort of specification as your production servers. Sysport uh, do recommend it is on a separate network, uh, but this is not always possible. So to aid that, we are documenting the steps for, for doing a, a build and a data refresh uh, on a sandbox environment. So now we're going to talk about the uh, sysbro.installer program, um, which is uh, used for all the software installs, updates and hot fixes. Um, to be applied on on the server. Everything has to go through the installer on the server. Um, alongside uh, the installer is uh, a deployment service, and this deployment service is the link between your uh, application server and the Cispro Azure deployment environment, which is where um, Cispro stores all the newly released programs, hot fixes, etc. And there is a database between uh, on, between your site and the Cispro deployment environment, and that tells us them what hot fixes you've applied, etc. To launch the um, installer, which I'm just going to uh, get to. Um, so this installer uh, is downloadable from the uh, Cispro InfoZone website. Um, We've got a, a particular one where we have dot support in the name, but the customer one will not have that. You just launch it, double click it. Um, we're not bothered about running it as uh, administrator because we want to see this UAC prompt. So yes. You need a Cispro InfoZone uh, login um, to log into this software. And when you do log in, to the installer um, and you perform an action, an action being applying a hotfix, updating some software or updating some services. As soon as you've used your credentials when you've logged in and performed an action within this installer, you will automatically be added to the email notification list for hotfixes. When you first log in, you'll also get the uh, customer ID and customer PIN number. Uh, if you don't know what these are, these are on your current Cispro 7 licenses and even probably on 6.1 licenses, uh, but certainly they're on the Cispro 8 license as well. When you do enter your customer ID and your PIN number, recommend you click on save the details. Click on continue. And this is talking to the uh, CISPRO Azure deployment environment, and it's getting all the information about what are the latest hotfixes, what are the latest updates for the services, etc. So I'm just gonna click on the CISPRO ERP software, which is primarily where all the uh, core CISPRO software sits. Um, CISPRO has this concept of a deployment group. A deployment group essentially is a list of software being installed on a machine. You're only allowed one deployment group per machine. Um, so we mentioned about the sandbox before, so you could create another deployment group here called sandbox. And when you install the software on the sandbox uh, server, it will have that deployment group and it will know the list of software that you've in installed. I'm gonna do a deeper dive on these hot fixes and update buttons in uh, following sections. So what I'm going to do now is just go back just to show you, sorry, I'll just show you the list of products that you can install. It's a long list. And if you are an existing Cispro customer, you can go into it. Uh, and if you want to add any more components, you just hit the box and you may have to fill in some parameters. But essentially at the bottom of the list, you will see all the products that have already been installed on this particular server machine deployment group. I'll just go back. And then the other element I want to quickly show you is the Cispro reporting services, which is under the Cispro additional software button. And then it's the button here, Cispro reporting software. 
and again it's just checking the products that are already installed okay and it can tell you straight away that I've already installed um, Crystal 2020 and if I click on select it also shows you what products of Crystal 2020 have already been installed uh, server side client side which is what is commonly known as the crystal runtime and designer which is the full-blown SAP crystal reports 2020 please note you do get an in uninstall button uh, and that will become relevant when we discuss um, the sispro 8 service updates okay so i'm just going to go back to the slide So, as you just saw in the installer, um, Crystal 2020 was introduced uh, in the latter part of the 21 R2 release and is uh, obviously standard in the uh, 2022 release. Um, what I would add is that um, to install the Crystal 2020 both on a server and on a client, you do have to uninstall all the other Crystal versions. But as I've just shown you uh, before, the uninstall button is made available within the installer. And you only have to click one of the uninstall buttons, it installs, uninstalls everything that you've already got installed. So you don't have to install uh, three times in my case, because that's what I've got installed. You install it, uninstall it once. Next on the is the release update. Uh, and this is just explaining how the process works. If you are an existing CISPR 8 um, site and you're upgrading to the 2022 release as an example, um, what happens is, um, because we're using uh, deployment groups, I the machine has this list of products that's got installed. Then it will, the installer will know what products it's already installed. Therefore, it will perform what's called a silent update to these products, which means there's no user intervention. Yeah, you just click the button to say perform the update, and because it's got that predefined list of software, it will go away and do it. Once it's finished that update. When you launch your CISPRO 8 client, first of all, the CISPRO 8 client will self-heal. There's no installation required for the CISPRO 8 client. And what will happen when you tr attempt to log in to any of the companies within CISPRO 8, an automatic minor database update will occur. First of all, it will update the CISPRO DB database, which is the system-wide database, and then it will do all the company databases that you've got defined within the CISPRO 8 environment. Just another point on the CISPRO 8 client. Um, as we mentioned in the CISPRO 7 section, um, there is a, a facility of creating a batch file to uh, enable the rollout of the CISPRO 8 client. We recommend if you do change your release on your server that you re-export this batch file because there is a new GUI ID associated with the product and the release number. And that batch file is also available, like I said, for the Crystal runtime as well. So essentially you are exporting twice, one for the Crystal runtime and one for the CISPRO 8 client. And um, if you want any, if you're interested in, in performing uh, a CISPRO 8 uh, release update then I recommend you visit our landing page um, because it does feedback to us and we're able to provide additional details to the person that's requesting the information. I'm just sharing that link to the landing page that Paul talked about just now. I think it's really important if you are already on 8 and considering an update to the latest release to reach out and have a look at that landing page. But also, as we've got different customers on different releases and had updates throughout versions, we've encountered certain known 
things that we have to do. So we need to make sure that you are in fact um, in the right version and updating all of the elements that are needed so that it just makes the process a lot smoother for your end users. And a lot of those gotchas, we make sure that we cover as part of that landing page as well. So I really would encourage you to take a look at that link that's shared in the chat if you're already on eight and considering moving to a newer version. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Okay, so we're now going to explore um, the, the ports, the CISPRO 7 uh, ports. Um, it's not going to be a big subject because um, CISPRO are moving uh, CISPRO 7 into uh, the legacy product status uh, from July uh, this year, which basically means there's no further uh, bug fixes or no further ports uh, for CISPRO 7. We are expecting uh, at least two uh, ports um, for CISPRO 7 this year, uh, one in April and hopefully one in June. Um, but don't be surprised if we get um, one in July, which will definitely be the final one, uh, only if there's any uh, critical ports uh, that need to be released. And similar to what you're doing probably now is you should always ensure that no users are logged in when you're applying these ports. Uh, Nexix, Nexix sorry, will continue to support our customers using uh, CISPRO 7. But please be aware, again, there are no more bug fixes or ports after July. So now um, let's do a deeper dive into the CISPRO installer um, around uh, CISPRO 8 hotfixes and updates. Okay. So, like CISPRO 7, um, users really shouldn't be logged in when you're applying hotfixes. Um, the reason for that is because some of the hotfixes, when you're applying them, do stop and start services. So please carry on that same standard with CISPRO 7 where you have users out of the system when you're applying these hotfixes. Obviously, if you had a sandbox, that'd be great. Um, so just to go through, I'm going to click on the hot fixes. Um, what I will say is that if you log into your installer and you come to this deployment group screen and you do not see the hot fixes button, then this is for one, one of two reasons. One, you're on the wrong machine. And two, it could be a corrupt um, deployment group or an issue with the deployment group. Now, this installer provides a nice little tool which can fix your uh, deployment group. So what we do here is you click on uh, the deployment group, in this case it's test, you edit it, you go to the details button, it confirms the machine that we're on, you go into the details, this lists out all the products it believes are installed, and all the hot fixes it believes it's installed, but there's a button up here called the health check. And this will just go away and check that the CISPRO deployment database is both in Azure and on your local SQL server environment are in sync and everything is updated and correct. It gives you a summary at the top of each heading. So no faults found, it's telling us what versions of each of the services so that's your core CISPRO, CISPRO client, your communication service, load balancer service, all these different services that we've installed. And then if you go towards the bottom, you'll see the hot fixes that have been applied to date. So we'll explain, there is a table that we'll go through in a minute on, on these hot fixes. Um, so there's not too many because it's only new out uh, that's been applied, um, but you can see there that one of them does say it's a mandatory hot fix. So um, we'll go into that in a minute. So I'm just going to go back. Oop, too far. So um, hot fix bus bu buttons should always appear. That's what I explained. The update button next to it um, may not be displayed. That button is only displayed if there is a um, service update 
or if there's a new release like there has been this Monday. So if you click on uh, the update button, in this case, because there's only uh, service uh, updates or product updates, they call it, um, it will only display those updates. But if there was a new release update or a product update, you'll get two buttons made available and you click on which one you want to apply. When it comes to uh, service updates, um, if you click on the hot fixes, and if you see any hot fixes with an asterisk against them, and in fact, an asterisk and the word service update, that is basically telling you that this hot fix belongs to that service update that we've just seen in the update button. The recommendation is that you do the service updates first and then apply the associated hot fix for that service update. So as you can see, we've got one at the top, which is very much for Espresso, and the fourth one down, uh, that is related to Avanti, although it doesn't say it, um, but that is related to Avanti, and that one is down there as well. Okay, I, I won't apply some hot fixes because it can take a few minutes because it downloads the hot fixes from the Azure environment, stores it on your uh, server, and then applies them individually to, to the environment. Uh, is there anything else on here? Nope, that's, that's it. Um, so I'll just explain the, a bit about the types of hotfixes. There you go, okay. So hope for this table um, will give you a nice summary of um, the types of hotfixes we've, that are. Um, I break certainly the, the first three as the main hotfixes, so mandatory. Um, as it says, it's a serious error, architecture change. Um, the key thing here is that uh, ideally you should apply it. And the bottom item though is it, it cannot be uninstalled. The next column is uh, bug fixes that you have reported as a customer. And therefore, if you have reported, the recommendation is that you do apply it because why log it if you don't want to apply it? Uh, the difference between the uh, mandatory and the optional is essentially that you can uninstall the optional hotfixes. Uh, the third one is obviously other optional hotfixes. Uh, customers worldwide have reported an issue. It may not impact you, but it's there um, and you can apply it when you want. Some people schedule a, a every quarter to apply all these optional hotfixes as well. And the last column is just explaining, and we have seen one in the in the list. Um, it does do a roll up of hot fixes, so you're not applying one to 99. You're applying 100, which is one to 99, um, which is similar to what we used to do with the, the ports. We used to do a consolidated uh, 7 port. Paul, just to interrupt really quickly here, I think one of the key mm -hmm. things to talk about is the difference between ports where it was the equivalent of the consolidated hotfix is what we're talking about, whereas the difference with CISPRO 8 is we are now talking about individual hotfixes. So if I have just one error correction, I can only apply that one hotfix. I don't necessarily have to apply all of the other ones, which Correct. I would have had to do in CISPRO yeah. 7. It's yeah. a consolidated report. There might be prerequisites, but in general, it is oftentimes a one-to-one, -one, which gives you that granularity and a little bit more control that this particular chart yes. really highlights. Fantastic. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Okay. Um, so next, we're going to go on to end of life. Um, sounds a bit severe, but... Um, just wanted to highlight that um, if you're not on the latest release, um, Nexus will endeavor to support your CISPRO version. Um, CISPRO 8 is supported on the latest operating system and SQL Server version, if anyone asked that question. Um, so that's Windows 2022 and SQL Server 2022. Um, there's a, a link there to uh, to have a look at all the supported platforms for the different versions of CISPRO. Believe it or not, I do get asked that quite a lot. So this table um, is going through some of the 
key products that have either come to the end of extended support life with Microsoft or have come to the end of the maintenance mainstream or mainstream maintenance even. Um, so SQL Server 2012 uh, ended last uh, July, I want to say. Um, Crystal Reports 2016, like I say, it's the end of the maintenance mainstream. It is still supported. Um, I.e. Priority One support ends in December 2024. And the deprecated SMTP basic um, authentication, uh, CISPRO has adapted to cater for the app password method, uh, which basically is uh, covering the, the fact that you can configure in Office 365 against the user's account and this app password can then be captured within CISPRO in the SMTP section under setup options and also against the operator itself. Automail has also been proven to work with this method as well. Uh, there does seem to be a bit of a pattern with the Microsoft end of support. Um, the, the rule of thumb seems to be that every 10 years after a, a version comes out, um, it then becomes out of end of support. So 2020, 2012 SQL has ended in 2022 and uh, SQL 2014 ends in 2024. And then from the Windows point of view, the Windows Server point of view, that seems to be every 11 years. So 2023 this year, Windows 2012 R2 is the end of extended support. And if I go further to the next release, which is uh, Windows 2016, that is end of extended support in 2027. There's a nice little link there at the bottom, which will take you to each year that you want to look at in advance. That just really helps in terms of planning ahead as well. If you're looking at your internal architecture, where are you at? Where do you need to maybe look at investment going forward as well and lining that up with what CISPRO is supporting? Okay, so next I'm going to go through quite a few, hopefully, technical tips and some uh, quite a few demonstrations. Um, so, uh, Microsoft SQL Server best practices. Uh, we, of course, want to try and ad adhere to this standard. We would want our customers to also adhere to these standards. Um, some of the things that I want to pick out here are the fact that using SSD disks uh, should be used. Uh, especially for uh, SQL transaction logs and SQL temp DB files. Um, fastest uh, write RAID configurations for, again, logs and the temp DB files. Those are the two workhorses in a SQL uh, environment. Um, stop using uh, the SQL administrator SA account. Um, it's a big no-no nowadays. Um, strong password policy is another thing that I'm a bit of a stickler for, and hopefully we will convince our customers to adopt that standard as well. Um, cap SQL uh, memory. Um, that is very important because SQL will take uh, all the memory if you don't um, cap it. Uh, and that is even if it is a dedicated SQL server. When you install SQL server, uh, it does actually uh, give you the option to implement the recommended uh, SQL memory. And, and I recommend you do accept that recommended memory on a SQL server, a dedicated SQL server. And the, the final thing on, on, on that subject is, ideally we want to see one drive, one job. Um, what I'm talking about there is that the databases, the logs, the tempdb are all on separate drives. Yes, there are people out there still providing us a C drive and a D drive, and that's it. But ideally, it just makes manageability better if, you, if you've got separate drives for separate jobs. Next item there is ODBC driver 17 for SQL Server. This essentially is a uh, ODBC software that you need to install on the application server. And if you do want to adopt um, some um, database file encryption, then this is the recommended driver that you use. Um, personal experience is not everyone is using that data encryption at the moment, 
but I'm sure it will come further down the line. So I'm just going to go into now the SQL Server Diagnostic Utility. This is a, uh, a program built into CISPRO since uh, CISPRO 6. Uh, so just bear with me up. There we go. It's just being a bit slow. So like I say, it's available in CISPRO 6 or above. Provides uh, information and status of your SQL Server and your current database that you're logged into. It provides details on any missing and or user-defined tables, indexes, columns, and foreign keys. And if I just expand uh, the verify foreign keys, you will see that I've actually um, got some missing uh, foreign keys deliberately. Uh, also built into the SQL Server uh, Diagnostic Utility is the uh, facility of generating scripts. The first script is uh, generating the indexes. So for some reason, if you have missing indexes, you can generate the script to recreate all those indexes. You've got the facility for generating um, the rebuild foreign key script and also to drop the foreign key script as well. Um, all these scripts, or three of them in total, are all saved into the server's WIC directory. You can also, from within here, just generally just drop the foreign keys and rebuild them as well. So, moving on from the SQL Server Diagnostic Utility is the uh, can't see it, it's behind there. Is the CISPRO SQL Health Dashboard. So this came out uh, in CISPRO 8. It's only available in CISPRO 8. And this is much, much more of a deeper dive into the SQL Server environment. This is now, um, it covers all the databases in use, whereas the other one was more focused on the database you were logged into or the company you were logged into. Upon launching um, this program, this will actually go away and check all the database statuses. And it provides this green stroke red flag status on the left hand pane. And as you can see, um, all but A has got a, a green flag and A is reporting obviously the issue that I've just highlighted in the previous program that we've got some uh, foreign keys. And over on the right hand side where these hyperlinks are, it gives you a summary of the tables, the columns, indexes, and in this case, the issues that we've got. And at the moment, I've got nine issues with my foreign keys. And if I click on this link, it will take you to that tab and uh, highlight that those uh, foreign keys are missing. What also it does do is if you ha do have a red flag, it also enables this button here at the top of the database details pane called repair issues. So if you've got a green flag, that is grayed out. If you've got a red flag, that becomes available. Clicking on that will actually fix those foreign keys. And it gives you a list of all the items that it will try and uh, fix for you, which I will click on. Hopefully it won't take too long, uh, but it will uh, repair that. And there you go. It's giving you the information to say it's been repaired. The other item I really wanted to talk about on this screen is the index fragmentation. So what this um, is telling you, it's not actually going to do the repairs for you. It's giving you some suggested functions that you need to be running against your uh, indexes. And you can see there, I'll just group these together. Oops, sorry. Okay, I've lost my column. There it is. Let's get it back on. I click group by field and I'm going to drag that to there. Okay, 
So what it's given us, don't know why I put the count there. So we're getting um, a lot saying uh, rebuild and we're getting some what say update statistics. I need to get rid of that. That's why that's okay. And I need to drag. Oh, it's gone, but never mind. Um, so yes, you get three different um, functions um, recommendations. It's rebuilding indexing, reorganizing the indexes, and the other one is update statistics. Now, generally, most people do have maintenance plans in place that will try and manage these uh, fragmentations and also update the statistics at the end of a week, as an example. So, moving on. It's conscious time, got, yeah, okay, we're going good. So uh, the next subject on the slides is talking about archiving and purging. Um, let's be honest, this is a taboo subject with most of our customers. Um, but if you do consider uh, purging, then uh, the recommendation is uh, to drop and recreate your indexes um, to try and improve your performance. And the other recommendation there is to shrink the database file because potentially you've cleared up uh, hopefully quite a bit of space within your database itself. Okay, uh, the next item is company copy. Um, I don't think I've come across any site that doesn't do a company copy, be it manually or be it through a program that we provide. Um, essentially, it is simpler than it was because we're not dealing with any CI SAM files. So it's essentially, it's a backup a restore from live to test. It's running a script that will update the company IDs from the live company ID to the test company ID. You then need to do a manual change of the logical file names on the test company database files. Uh, and if you don't want to do all them, we of course have still got our uh, Nexus SysPro8 company copy program, which does all these items for you um, at the push of a button. So next, I'm going to go into the uh, security settings dashboard. There it is. So what is this? Um, well, this lets the administrators query operator security settings, uh, and it's all within a single program. It verifies which operators have access and how the access is configured. It is possible to view any program conf conflicts. It has smart links built into it. It's to enable you to uh, launch uh, related programs, for example, the operator um, files program. Um, it's useful to uh, look at the fields that are available to you. So if you click on the field chooser, you can obviously add uh, conflicts into here. Um, if you click on the system information and expand the license setup, it gives you a summary of your current license setup. If you click on uh, a particular um, company, again, it'll exp expand it. Thank you. It tells us, you know, how many programs we've got in use, how many of these are secured. Um, it's gives you a lot of detail which will aid the administrator to understand. It will um, help you um, to identify any issues that you've got around the security uh, within the system. The next item we're going to go through is the system audit query. Go. There it is. Just getting a bit of a delay. Thank you. Um, I find this quite useful. This uh, program actually. Um, this is this program is to view um, any changes or events that have occurred in Cisbro and which affect 
the uh, system security. It does use the job logging tables to query, um, which if I'm honest, they should be managed. The size of the tables should be managed because if I was to click on this and say all transactions and, and all categories, um, it will say that you've got X number of thousands of, of rows of data. Do you wish to continue with this? So having a managed size job logging and a uh, managed size um, system audit table uh, will will improve the performance of this. But this I've I've clicked on um, access denied to program. But as you can see, the list is huge of what you can um, look at or query. Um, but I've picked on access to a denied program um, because. As I mentioned right at the start, when you upgrade from CISPRO 7 or earlier version to CISPRO 8, there has been some uh, new programs introduced. And what this will do is it will highlight to you as in, in a CISPRO 8 project, upgrade project, uh, which actual operators have hit a problem where they've tried to load what was a CISPRO 7 program, um, but they do not have access to the newly named program. So it could be like say trial balance, for example. Um, well, this will highlight which users are hitting those problems, and obviously you can then um, discuss do they need access or not, and then obviously grant them access uh, to that program. Um, like I said, there is a purge option for this as well as job logging, so please um, adhere to it. And the last section demonstration is going to be on the system information. I'll be very, very surprised if anybody on attending this now doesn't know about CISPRO system information, um, also known as Shift F7. Um, this can be launched from any program within CISPRO. Um, it views, obviously, your current system information as well as your CISPRO environment information. It provides program versions, which, of course, is very useful for support. Um, it aids them identifying if that program has been fixed and therefore um, can recommend the hotfix number to, to apply uh, that fix. Um, a lot of people do use this for uh, viewing the current users and I strongly recommend you also use it for this purpose. So current users, um, recommend that you tick show detail. Also recommend that you tick include SQL blocks. And this is, uh, it did sort of come out in CISPRO 7, but it's certainly here, um, definitely in CISPRO 8. A um, couple of things that you need to uh, be aware of. Um, obviously, if you have any unknown processes, which there is none here, which will be, we'll notice them because I'll have uh, question marks um, against them. Um, recommend, obviously, you do end all unknown processes um, because they can take up um, some of your CPU on your server. And also the uh, SQL blocks, which will appear at the bottom here, it will identify which operator, obviously, which program they're, they're, they're running that's causing uh, the blocking. And then, obviously, it's up to you to then go to that operator and discuss uh, exactly what they're running and and is it possible to, to end that to free up um, the block and therefore allow users to, to carry on okay and if i go back and now we are in the questions and answers section Excellent. Thanks so much, Paul, for going through all of that. That hopefully gives everyone a good sense of things they can think about. Maybe lose a little bit of sleep over if you haven't already been planning for some of these things or make you feel like you're doing the right thing and, and charge ahead. We are open for questions. If you wanted to go ahead and type anything that you've got in the question and answer panel, we've got a little bit of time still available. We're not at the top of the half hour, so we're available. If you've got anything you've been burning to ask Paul, now's your time. Are they awake? 
Absolutely. I think people are furiously <laughs> starting to type away. <laughs> There's a question that's come in. Um, oh gosh, this is a, a, a nice big doozy. I have no maintenance plan. How is it best to formulate this? Who's that from? Come on, give us the... No, no, no names. <laughs> <laughs> and it may be something that um, we, need, we need to pick up after as well. So I am conscious that that's, that's a pretty well, broad question. Well, yeah, it is. Uh, I mean, it, it is pretty straightforward to create them. Um, it's just ensuring that you cover um, what we deem as the right tasks that they should be run. So uh, I'll probably rattle them straight off. So uh, a database consist consist consistency check, easy for me to say, uh, a database backup. You should have two tasks that run the uh, uh, percentage check on your fragmentation. So if it's greater than 30%, it should be doing a rebuild. And if it's uh, between 5 and 30%, it should be doing a uh, reorganization of the indexes. Obviously, you should have transaction log backups. And, um, and that's across uh, mainly the user databases that I've discussed. Uh, system databases, yes, you should still do the DB um, consistency check. You should also do the database backup of all the system databases. And um, people forget about this, but the, uh, the model database has a transaction log, so you should be doing a transaction log of the model database as well. And obviously, you just need to come up with how long do you want to keep these backups on disk. Uh, most people tend to uh, have another backup solution in place, like Veeam or something like that. Um, so more often than not, two days tends to be people are happy with that um, because they've got this other backup strategy in, in place as well. But it is all done through the maintenance plan wizard, which is like um, it's like a flowchart type um, setup. So you just drag and drop and link the tasks together. So it's pretty straightforward. Excellent. And, and um, there's a comment that's come back as well to say the index fragmentation that's been discussed here has also been really helpful. So that's great. We've got quite a few questions that have come in, so I'm going to charge through some of them. The first one is actually related somewhat to the fact that we're talking about SQL. It's uh, The question is, what is the cause of all the errors and foreign keys? <laughs> well, Obviously, the error then was because I ran a script that dropped all <laughs> those uh, foreign <laughs> keys. Um, I would probably say that sometimes after a migration, for some reason or not, the foreign keys, although it reports that it has recreated them at the end of a migration, it could be that that hasn't done it. So straight after a migration, I would always ensure that you run the SQL Health dashboard. So what I'm talking about there, if someone's upgraded from seven to eight or any previous version, um, go in and check, do the SQL Health dashboard straight after the migration. Yes, it should be something that we we do, but for your own comfort, you know, do it yourself, get familiar with it. Um, yeah, you, you, there is. Um, I'm sorry, I've just been working with yesterday, and and they're not live, but I know they're restoring um, the dev database over the live production database. But of course, they've been doing transactions within that. Well, obviously, they need to delete those transactions out of the, uh, the restored um, production database um, to, to ensure that they start with a zero balance. Well, obviously, SQL script that does a delete um, won't work if all the foreign keys are in place. So they're going to have to drop the foreign keys and that would be an example that I've told them that if they do run the drop and then do the delete, they have to run the recreate foreign keys. So if they do forget it, then that's another example of um, not doing it. Um, I've not seen Cispro dropping them um, for any other reason other than through a migration. Perfect. That answers the question. <laughs> um, I think that that's a pretty comprehensive question, absolutely. We've got a couple of questions that have come up in and around hotfixes. We'll start with the first one. Do your customers typically apply all the hotfixes as they appear available? I, I, I would say that people are scheduling them to be applied. So like I said, uh, maybe every quarter or, or it could be earlier, it could be later. But 
it's that concept of hang on you're applying hot fixes which could make a change to your uh, production system and i'm really trying to push everyone towards a sandbox uh, solution because that gives you the comfort that if you do apply all those optional hot fixes that you have put it through a testing phase obviously they are tested by CISPRO. yes people applying them um, all the time um, it's just a policy that you're happy with um, without trying to impact your production system absolutely and I think it, it really is about best practice depending on the environment that you're running on are you running in a 24-7 environment where you've got short windows of maintenance or you, depending mm, on the impact yeah. of the hot fixes as well one of the things that you'll have noticed when Paul was going into the program itself is you can see some of the details you've got an additional information button that's available against the hot fix so you can drill in and look to see what's been impacted and what's been fixed and make a sensible decision as to whether that's applicable to your business if that's something that's going to affect your process flow as well so that's something else you might want to be thinking about as you're looking at the hot fixes now related to that question we've got another one that's come in that says does the hot hot fix utility only offer those that are required for my system or everything that's available and i think that's a really good question actually it's worth going back to that chart that you've got up if it's easy enough to get to poll if you while we answer that particular question And so when it comes to, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's going back a little bit, um, as, as you're yeah. getting to that, it, there are different types of hotfixes that are available. And depending on the type of hotfix is what you're going to see within the hotfix utility. One more, two more. It really was at, closer to the beginning of that. There you go. And, there yeah. we go, perfect. So the mandatory hotfix is going to be available for everyone. It doesn't matter if it's specific to you or not because it is deemed to be required as an update to the entire system across the CISPRO customer base. It will be relevant to the version or rather the release of CISPRO 8 that you're on. And then Paul, I'll get you to speak to the customer specific and other optional if that's okay. Yeah, essentially the customer specific is, is is you have reported, you found an issue with uh, CISPRO 8, the version that you're on, you report that through the standard method uh, through our support desk and uh, CISPRO will come back and say, hey, it's been fixed um, and it's been fixed on this one. And as, as it states there, you will be notified as soon as you do uh, an installer um, activity, you will be um, notified via email that the mandatory hot fixes and the customer specific, i.e. you as a customer, and uh, you'll be notified. The ones you won't get notified for is all the uh, hot fixes that have been reported by other customers throughout the world. So essentially you will see all the hot fixes. It's just optional if you apply all the hot fixes. Mandatory, yes. Customer specific options, optional ones we would recommend you do apply them it's the other ones is it's entirely up to you but we are seeing people applying all the hot fixes hopefully uh, that clarifies basis. yeah no definitely and hopefully that clarifies hot fixes a little bit further but if not please feel free to use the the q a panel and if we don't get to answer your question We'll definitely make sure that we follow up after the fact. And we're getting close to the top of um, the half hour. We'll keep answering questions because we've got the time. But just in case you need to drop off, we understand you've got the rest of the day to go on. Then thank you very much for joining us. I'm going to continue on with um, another question that has come through. In the health dashboard, which is one that uh, you showcased, is it best practice to have all of the users prior to running repair issues? I think that's a great question. Sorry, have all users? Should all of the users be out of CISPRO prior to running the yes. repair? Oh, absolutely. And especially, especially if you're doing a repair, definitely. Absolutely. Ah, Obviously, so I know I'm doing, doing this environment, <laughs> environment so yes. Um, just for a viewing point of view, fine. You can run this while users, uh, but if you are clicking on, on that button, such as repair issues, then yes, please don't have users uh, logged in at the time. Perfect. And I think that's true of any of the other fixes that we're talking about as well, is you want to make sure that your users aren't engaging and actively in the system. If you've been building in diseases, um, 
we talked about yeah. earlier, even in older yeah. versions, you don't want to yeah. be doing that when users are engaging in the system no. or you've got maintenance plans kicking in and so on. Perfect. Yeah. Um, can Common you confirm? Sense. Yes, absolutely. But it's 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 good to confirm. No, no. It's absolutely good to confirm. Yeah. There's a question here that's come in and it's specifically related to Crystal Reports 2020, which is a good question actually. Can you confirm that Crystal Reports 2020 is using 64-bit for client server? For clients, so is this for the Crystal Runtime element or the server element? No, um, so I, that's a good point. I actually, we need to clarify because I know that the server element is definitely 64-bit, but I just want to yes, make sure actually, um, if you want to confirm, are we talking about Okay, the question is for both elements. There we go, we've had a confirmation. Yeah. I actually don't know the answer about the client-side reporting Client. for 2020. And, and one of the things I would say is that the vast majority of customers who are on CISPRO 8, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, are using server-side. There's very few that have switched it off. Um, I can only think of a few in, in that I've dealt with that I've switched it off. <clears throat> so server side seems to, it is a much better product if people have experienced it in CISPRO 7. Um, so it is much better product, definitely. Um, it's just understanding um, what needs to be in place to make it work the way you want it to work. Uh, and we do have some documentation if anyone wants to understand what these steps are that you need to make server side work for you properly. But in an, a brief description, it's things like adding printers to the application server or the server where the server side is installed. Um, and it's uh, if you're using um, ODBC connections, it's adding the ODBC DSNs onto the application server because at the end of the day, it's the server that's running the report. So it's the server that needs that ODBC connection through to the SQL to, to in, in, inquire uh, on the data. Perfect. Um, and if we haven't answered that, Chris, I think you're asking specifically about 64-bit on the client version as well. I don't know that for a fact, but I will follow up. We've got um, a question about a file being too large to purge keeps timing out. We'll have to pick that one up separately if that's okay. I know that um, I've got your contact details. There is one that applies I believe broader. The question is the hotfix panel on the CISPRO client home screen. Is is that only for mandatory hotfixes? Do I have to configure a particular user to see this light up or does it appear on all users? Uh, th this, sorry, let me go back to it. Yeah, so this button perfect. here we're talking about. Um, first, first of all, what you get notified here in, in text is it will tell you if there's any mandatory ones and if there's any specific to you as a customer. So your customer uh -huh. optional ones. It, tell, it tells you that in Word format here. Yeah. So when you click on hot fixes, it will take you to the mandatory ones and your customer specific ones first because it's assuming quite rightly that you're going to be applying them. So when you apply the mandatory and the customer specific hot fix, if you click on the hot fixes button again, that will then show you all the other hot fixes, a worldwide customer uh, logged hot fixes. It will give you the whole list of all the hot fixes that you still haven't applied because they're not specific to you and they're not mandatory. Right, um, the question's been clarified that. actually. Uh, the question's been clarified, which is, in the CISPRO client itself. So actually, Paul, you've got CISPRO up. If I can get you go to jump right into CISPRO. Oh, sorry, On yes, you can manage the... Uh, that's it, yeah. that's exactly. So the question is basically the hotfix button there. How does that, on the top right corner, that's... Sorry, uh, my, that's it. the pen's in the middle of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, so, so that will give you a list of the mandatory and your customer specific hot fixes uh, that are available to you. So obviously there's none at the moment available 
uh, to us. This will not give you the list of all the other hotfixes. So this is another way of notifying you as a user. And I think what you're trying to say is, is this available to, to everybody to see, I think? Um, I think the answer is yes, it is. But you can't apply it through Syspro. You have to always do it through the Syspro installer running on the deployment machine or server. Correct. Yeah. And there is there are other things as well, which um, you can manage the notification um, from within. Um, sorry, I've lost my there's there's a program actually within the program list itself. Yeah, that will give you additional details around hotfixes. So it's a good point because you can see right off the main menu, the fact that hotfixes are flashing up for your users, but you can, as part of your maintenance tasks, one of the things we didn't talk about in this particular session is the fact that we've got hotfixes available right in here. Now I cheat, Paul, and I go ahead and use my control F to find the program yeah. for hotfixes right <laughs> within. I won't recommend you type in hot on the internet, by the way. <laughs> Within Syspro, it's quite safe. So within here, you can see Back there are there. two programs that oh, are available. Yeah. And so yeah. what you'll see... So available hot fixes, which is the same as that button up there. Uh, so this should say there's no hot fixes which it does. And this one is, and you can also do this through the installer as well, but whilst you're in Cisco, you can, um, as long as they've done an activity, so you do see all your operators in here, but as long as they've done an activity within the installer, then you can actually tick the box to say that they're not, they can be notified. This looks like it's changed actually. So, and then what happens is with the notification, an email is sent when you get a customer specific hot yes. fix. So that's not necessarily in Cisco. Or, or mandatory. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Absolutely. And then the final place we can go for you to go in and look a little bit further is if you take a look at the Cisco software installed query, that will tell you about the hot fixes and any additional options that are there. So hopefully that yeah. gives you a little bit more detail, probably more than you wanted at this point, but that should give you a little bit more to help, hopefully, some of your users. That. And like you say, obviously, you can look at more details on the hotfixes by clicking on the, the more button. To the, more to button. I couldn't remember what it was called. Yeah. Wonderful. And it tells you exactly all about it. So we've answered all of the questions as far as I can see in the Q&A panel. Hopefully that's been useful to everyone and thank you very, very much for joining us today. If we've missed anything, absolutely feel free to drop us an email. There will be a recording that's shared with everyone at the end of this. Otherwise, we'll see you in another month's time with a webinar on specifically some of the new changes in CISPRO 8. Until then. Have fun. Thank you.